Hallelujah. Today, uh, today I want to speak to you about the wonderful doctrine of illumination. And uh, what is the doctrine of illumination? Well, uh, the Holy Spirit helps believers to understand the truths of the Bible. And he draws people to the Bible and they get the wonderful honey from the scriptures and the word becomes a light unto their path and they are able to be illuminated in the in the glorious uh, bible open thou mine eyes that i may behold wondrous things out of thy law psalm 119 verse 18 and this is a glorious thing and I want to give you an example of it. I want you to turn to Johannan uh, chapter chapter uh, 20, verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the to the kever, the tomb, and he that this would be Johannan, he saw. And he believed. Now, the question is, what did he see? Now, most people would read that and they would say, well, you know, I really don't know what he saw. What did he see? But uh, let's just let the Holy Spirit illumine the word for us. And let's see the, the doctrine of illumination in practice in a practical way right now, right here, because he did not make a blind leap of faith. He was like a, um, a crime scene analyst looking at a crime scene and drawing an inference. Uh, and remember I told you about that word gar, gamma alpha rho in Acts chapter 10, where, uh, you know, around 45, 46, 47, or along in there, uh, where Kepa draws an inference. He hears them speaking in glossolalia. And then based on that evidence, you might say crime scene evidence, because there are anti-charismatics that think speaking in tongues is a crime. But anyway, he draws an inference from the evidence, the crime scene evidence, that tongues are the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit that he had back in Acts chapter 2. So the Jews got their Pentecost on Shavuos, and the non-Jews got their Pentecost in Cornelius' house. And all of that is uh, in Acts chapter 10. And there's an inference drawn. What is an inference? It's where you you see something and you make a conclusive uh, you make a conclusive observation. Uh, there's there's droplets on my forehead, and I'm walking outside, so that means it's starting to rain. I make an inference about the weather based on that evidence. Okay, well here, Johannan, who is very, very intelligent, and he's very anointed. He's the one that wrote the book of Revelation and 1st, 2nd, 3rd Johannan, and also the Gospel of Johannan. Uh, he makes a, 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 an, an inference, and he, he, he very adroitly sees that the body of Yeshua is gone. The grave clothes, however, remain in the tomb in the exact location. And and it's it's like his body was wrapped. The wrappings were around the dead body of Yeshua. He was buried on Friday afternoon. And, of course, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea got permission from Pilate, and they certified that Yeshua was dead. 
And so they they took the body down and they uh, arranged for a proper Jewish burial. All that is found in Yohanan chapter 19, verses 31 to 42. And they, they gave Yeshua a traditional Jewish uh, funeral or burial. And the, what is the Jewish custom? Wrapping the body in strips of linen cloths filled with spices. And these cloths were like bandages wrapped around and around and around the body and then sprinkling the powdered spices and the gooey gummed fragrances into the folds as they continued to wrap the body. Now, can you imagine uh, if we were on, on a stage with, with an audience and, uh, and I did that to you, and you were alive, and I said, you know, this guy is going to escape those uh, wrappings. He's a Houdini escape artist, and he's going to get out. Well, after the, the cloths go around and around and around and around, and each time they go around, more gooey stuff is put in the folds, and more powder is sprinkled. Do you, do you actually think you would be able to get out of that? The audience, you know, Houdini would have the audience purposely wait and wait and wait during one of his escape acts to build up the tension and the drama so that when he did walk out, everybody would uh, cheer and they would have all this great uh, joy and relief that he got out. But we're not talking about having a a pick in your mouth hidden under your tongue uh, and, and and using it to get handcuffs off. We're talking about something that no Houdini could escape because not only did he have the mummy-like wrappings on his body, but he had a separate cloth for his head and it was rolled around his head and it was also filled with these spices. It was like a large handkerchief. It was uh, a very large face cloth and it was wrapped in a turban-like wrapping around and around and around. And the head was covered with this cloth that twirled around the head in a crisscross-like turban. And uh, then they put the body on a stone slab uh, that had been hewn out, hewn uh, out of the side of the cave tomb. Uh, Lazarus was buried in a similar way. Look at John chapter eleven, verse forty-four. And now Johanan, this young boy, he runs faster than Kepha. He gets there first. He doesn't go in. Kepha goes in first. I'm, I'm telling you the contents of Johanan chapter twenty. And when he looks inside the tomb, he sees the face cloth, the turban that had been around the head of Ribi Melech Hamoshiach. And he singles this out. This, this, this really gets his attention. And he mentions it when he tells us the story. And you know what? He comes to faith. And this is before any resurrection appearances. There were Tahiyas Hamasim appearances. And these were witnessed by eyewitnesses. So if you want to say to me, Phil, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in pie in the sky by and by. Well, listen, friend, the pie is not by and by. It's already come here. It's already been seen and tasted. What our hands have touched, what our eyes have looked at, what our gaze has, has, uh, has uh, seen, we declare to you the first chapter of the first epistle of Johannan. This is truly one of the Egrot Kodesh, my friend. Don't talk to me about Egrot, Egrot Kodesh letters. This is one. 
and you're not reading it. And it's a big problem for you because uh, the ignorance in this, in this thing, you cannot afford. So what I'm saying is, if, if you can imagine somebody who's had a severe head trauma and uh, maybe they've not, they've got a concussion and maybe it's even worse than that. They're brought into the ER. Okay. They take a bandage and they start wrapping it around the person's head. Now you see people like that with a great big thick bandage around part of their head. Well, that's what we're talking about here. But in this case, it goes over the nose, over the mouth, around the neck, the whole area. I mean, look, if you were alive, you would definitely suffocate. And the whole head is rolled up. And then notice this. He says it is neatly placed in an area all by itself. It means it, it has been put separately from the rest of the linen clothes, cloths, which were used for the body wrapping. It's been rolled up with its own separate wrappings. And as, as Johannan is looking at this, he's seeing that these things have not been tampered with, that he can actually see the imprint of the Messiah's body. Wow. He can see that the, clo the cloths are still exactly in the same place and, and, and around the same shape of the body of the Messiah as they were when they were placed there. You remember you remember the, the women had to leave because it was Shabbos and then they come they came back on on the first day of the week. Uh, but they did get the body wrapped and the spices placed there. Uh, so most of that was done. But it's obvious that Yeshua had unmistakably been raised from the dead by the power of God. There was, there was no grave robber that had raised him up. And, and, and this was convincing evidence for Yohanan. When he saw the position of the burial wrappings, when he saw the condition of the uh, the position and the condition of the wrappings in the form that he saw them in, where they weren't ripped open, but they were in the form of, of the Moshiach's body, the actual shape around his body, the head cloth not unwrapped, but folded up neatly. Folded up neatly. Now let me ask you something. If you're a, if you're a grave robber, and you get in there and you take a knife and you rip open this this uh, this mitznef this this uh, mitznefet this uh, well I should I should say the um, the takrahim. It's called takrahim. It's the body shroud that goes a, a, around the body. If you take a knife and rip that open. And then you, you also have to take a knife and rip, rip open the head shroud. And then you pick this dead corpse up and you hightail it out of there with the dead corpse. Don't you think you would be leaving a kind of messy scene behind? And don't you see that that's not what John saw? He saw the head wrapping neatly folded and set aside and it was in the place where it had been about his head and every fold was the same around his body the grave clothes 
as they had been, still there in place. Everything was just as it was when the women did their work. When uh, in the afternoon of Friday, as the sun started to go down Friday afternoon, and there was only one thing that was different from the way the ladies left the shrouds. And that was this. The body was gone. The body had obviously dematerialized. The grave clothes had collapsed. The body had dematerialized under the weight of the spices. You don't you 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 go go back and look at how many spices there were. The heavy spices. Enough spices for a king's burial. The cloths themselves were undisturbed. There was no body in a, in in the cloths. That was the only change. And when John saw this, he immediately made the inference that just like Peter made an inference about the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the word gar he tells you that's an inferential conjunction for he said how can we deny these people total and in Dermikva for we see that they are speaking in tongues just as we did in Acts chapter 2 is basically what he's saying there in Acts chapter 10, verses 45, 46, 47, along in there, he's telling, he's telling you that he's made an inference. And now, Johanan is making an inference that he has gazed upon the evidence of the resurrection. And he was the very first disciple to believe that Moshiach had risen from the dead. The tomb was empty. There was no dead body. His quick mind processed that Yeshua had overcome death and brought immortality to light. And the burial wrappings and the sharp intuitive mind and the inference that there was no body snatcher involved here, no grave robber. Uh, nobody had unwound all those strips of sticky, spice-filled bandages. The grave was undisturbed. The clothes demonstrated that something miraculous had happened. The body just disappeared. It disappeared out of the wrappings. You say, wait a minute, Phil, wait a minute. What scripture do you have to jump to that conclusion? Well, go back to the end of Luke, uh, the 24th chapter. These two guys are walking along. A third man joins them. Their eyes are not permitted to recognize him. He asks them what's going on. They tell him about what's going on, that uh, there were some angels that were sighted and these women were running back and telling the Shalihim about the angelic encounter, et cetera, et cetera. But really, basically, the main point was, don't you know what happened? The, the great man, Yeshua, the way they treated him, what happened to him today? I mean, uh, not today, uh, uh, two days before. Uh, you, you, you're, what are you, an out-of-towner? You didn't know this? I mean, this would be like somebody in New York that doesn't know about 9-11 uh, on 9-13. What do you mean? You didn't know about 9-11? This is 9-13 and you didn't know it? And, um, and so then they get to this house. The, the guy seems to be going going on it's like he's going to keep walking and they say wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute come inside with us and so they have a little time of fellowship 
but it says, when he broke the bread, he disappeared from their eyes. But then before that, it says that their eyes were allowed to actually recognize him. They, they saw him. And they, they knew who he was. But then he vanished. He disappeared. And what we're saying here is that in the same way, the, the mummy-like windings around the body were left, but what was inside the body, the uh, wrappings, that body disappeared. The same way it did when the room is locked. Now this, you'll have to look at the end of John. It says that the doors were shut and suddenly he was in their midst. In other words, he materialized in their midst. Now, this this completely blew Johannan's mind. Uh, no one removed the bindings from around the face or loosened it or or did anything of the kind like they did with Lazarus. Look at John chapter 11, verses 40, uh, verses uh, of, well, go, read that whole area right up to verse uh, 43. Uh, chapter 11 of John. Yeshua was not resuscitated, as in the case of Lazarus. Yeshua was changed as a resurrection person. Not a resuscitation or a near-death experience where you come back from the dead. No. He is in a completely different kind of body, a resurrection body, a, 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 a body for heaven, a body fit for eternity, a miraculous body, a spiritual body, a wonderful body. During the next 40 days, he modeled that body for all of them. God did it. This, this is something that is incredible. But he, he was seen. And, and during the 40 days and 40 nights that followed, he would be seen over and over again. He passed through the grave cloth and through the locked door and through the stone cave. He was alive. Not resuscitated. We're talking about the resurrection of the dead. Now, when you go into a graveyard and you know that your mother was a born-again believer and you look down at her tomb and you think, oh, will I ever see her again? How could she ever get out of that tomb? I mean, they put her in this concrete vault. And then they put a lid on that. And of course she's in the casket. And then they put the dirt on top of that. How could she ever function in heaven or in, the, in an afterlife? But if you study the story of the resurrection appearances of Yeshua HaMashiach, you see the kind of body she will have. And he didn't need the stone rolled away to get out of there. <clears throat> the stone was rolled away by the angels so that the people could get in and see that the grave was empty and look at the crime scene evidence. And it says in John chapter 20, verse 5, he bent down and saw the strips of linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. And everything was just as it was, but it was neatly left. And the head wrapping especially brought faith. 
And when he looked in, he saw it. All of a sudden, it all clicked. Everything made sense. It was obvious that Yeshua was alive. Now, there's a movie called The Invisible Man. Well, there may be more than one, but the classic version of it. Uh, this guy is invisible. Uh, and uh, when he wraps himself up, you can see his the outline of his body. But when he unwraps himself, he is invisible. Now, th this, this was done with special effects that were quite uh, advanced for the time. And people who saw this movie were really shocked. How in the world did they do that? And if you want to know, you can Google it and find out. But what I'm saying is that's sort of what happened here. And it wasn't a movie. It was reality. He saw with his own eyes. Yohanan, he tells you that in the first letter of Yohanan. But here in chapter 20, he's telling you what he saw even before that. He had faith even before that. It was not just an empty tomb. There was evidence in that tomb. And this is what we're talking about tonight. Now, this is not just anybody's resurrection, my friend. This is not just anybody. This is not just any tomb. This is not just any grave clothes. Absolutely undisturbed. 2,000 pound stone door. Uh, all those spices, those heavy spices. This was not somebody who had a swoon. This was not somebody who tricked the Romans and really didn't die. This was the body of Yeshua that had miraculously, supernaturally, simply dematerialized and disappeared and became invisible with the grave clothes collapsed. And the body mysteriously evaporated. The resurrection body. And what we find out from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, is that this is the judge who will judge the whole world. This isn't just anybody's body. This is the judge of the this is the judge of the world. This is the one you're going to have to stand before. There is a subpoena already uh, being delivered to you. The gospel is being preached all over the world. Everybody in the world knows through the gospel that they have to make a court appearance with this judge and that their sins cause his death if you judge yourself you will not be judged but if you don't judge yourself and repent and get right with this judge then because all judgment has been turned over to him you are in big trouble when judgment time comes and when you are arraigned in the courtroom to stand before him. And this, this is what we're talking about. Hallelujah. And the testimony of the witnesses are all over the place. First Corinthians 15, 35 to 50. First John 3, 2. Uh, a literal physical body, a body fit for the resurrection. Forty days this body was seen. Forty days it materialized and dematerialized. Forty days 
they got a foretaste of heaven by seeing someone in a heavenly body. And the angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has stood up. So he did stand up. And he's already ready to judge the whole world. And what he's waiting for is for you to confess him. He is Adonainu, Morenu, Moshienu. He is the Shofet Kol Haaretz. He is your judge. He will return to judge all men. All men will be arraigned. He has set a day on which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. So this is what Johannes saw in the empty tomb. And Lord, I want to pray that everyone that listens to this rather long uh, this this rather long sermon will come to the conclusion that the evidence warrants that this was the Bar Enosh that he was on the glory cloud he did come to the Ancient of Days he was miraculously brought by the Ruach HaKodesh to materialize in the womb of a virgin and then to materialize in the upper room, to materialize on the road to Emmaus, to materialize in the Galilee and this one with the supernatural entrance in the womb of a virgin made a supernatural exit when he was lifted up on the glory cloud and taken away. And the angelic announcement was in the same way that you saw him taken away, he will come again. The bar Enosh will come again. The bar Enosh will restore the desolated inheritances. He is the new Joshua. He is the Acts, he is the Isaiah 49, 8 Joshua. He's the Kohen Le'olam of Everty Melchizedek. He, he is the, the new Joshua Ben Nun, but also the new Joshua Ben Yehotzedek. And these two Joshuas in the Tanakh are Anshe Mofet, men of the of the portent. Because when the angel told Yosef bin Dovid, look, you're his stepfather, name your stepson with this name, which means Hashem will save. Uh, this was already in the Tanakh. Zechariah had already seen this and and said to to this Kohen Gadol who was rebuilding the base Hamikdash, "Your name is the Zemach, the son of David. Hallelujah, who will be hanged on a tree." Yes. How do we know this? Because Avshalom ben Dovid was hanged on a tree and pierced. They pierced my hands and my feet. How do we know it says that? Because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, where the word meanings, meaning they pierced is actually there. And in the ancient versions, nobody translates like a lion because they aren't seeing like a lion. They're seeing they pierced. And so 
in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, in Second Shmuel uh, chapter 18, and Baratheus chapter 3 verse 15, and all these references, this glorious gospel is in the Tanakh. And Lord, I want to pray right now. Would you pray with me? Moshiach ben Dovid, I believe there is going to be a resurrection. I believe I will be resurrected. I believe that the the body that the Moshiach had in his resurrection that he modeled for me, I will have a body like that because of the grace of God, not because of my mitzvahs, not because of my, deser- my, my that I deserve it, but because you, dear God, have uh, prepared a place for me so that where you are, there I may be also. And, oh, God, we want to thank you for the book of Revelation and for all the passages in the Bible about heaven because we have a hope beyond this life. And we receive you right now, Yeshua, and we, we proclaim and we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised you from the dead, that the Takahim and the Mitznefet head wrapping show that you dematerialized and materialized in your appearances. And these were Tzahiyas Hamasim appearances. And there is a Tzahiyas Hamasim. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. Lord, by your mercy, let me be with those who have eternal life because I believe that you died for me and that your uh, Pesach Korban Kippurah Your asham guilt offering with your nefesh satisfied God, and my sins are forgiven, and I give you the glory. And everybody said, Amen.